Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1154 with a release and air date of Saturday, April 10th, 2021. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1154 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Youth on the Air, or Yoda, International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 announces a brand new contest which will happen across three weekends this year. We will have all the details. Riley Hollingsworth and the Volunteer Monitor Program releases its report for last month. We will have it for you. A high-ranking military official says that the Military Amateur Radio Service, or MARS, is not always an obvious resource in emergencies. A successful emergency communications exercise in Florida combines amateurs and various federal and state agencies. Oklahoma's section manager steps down and a new section manager is appointed. We will introduce you. The Dayton Amateur Radio Association announces upcoming activities for the Dayton Hamvention Weekend. World Amateur Radio Day 2021 is coming up fast. There are a lot of activities planned. We will tell you how you can participate. A recent study reveals that FT8 Digital now accounts for more than two-thirds of all HF activity. Amateur Radio is granted a temporary reprieve on the 3.5 gigahertz band, and the time is almost up for what are called Franken-FMs as the deadline for the switch off of the remaining low-power analog television stations is rapidly coming up. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to talk about how a recent study finds that your phone is sending data back to its manufacturer every day. He will also take a look at the latest data breach at some colleges and companies across the country and looks at Microsoft's announcement that it wants to buy Discord. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, looks at when you just have to give something a try. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at what life was like for amateur radio operators during the early 1930s. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the different methods of sealing coax connections on your tower. And this week we have a special feature. Amateur radio was the early beginning for a career in radio for Art Bell, W6OBB, who became one of America's number one late night talk show hosts. Art's audience on Coast to Coast AM grew to 15 million listeners in over 500 markets. Art will discuss how he got into ham radio and his broadcast career in this QSO Today interview conducted by Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, back on March 19th, 2016. All of that and a whole lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the weather outside has been indeed frightful, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from our news bureau from historic Armory Square in downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where Mother Nature laid a nasty April 1st joke on us with three inches of snow, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the tops of the trees have just begun to bud, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau, just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, 
I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2 MOB. And back in Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Leading off this week's news, Team YOTA of Youngsters on the Air in IARU Region 1 has announced it will sponsor a new contest, the YOTA Contest. For more details on the new contest series, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME at League Headquarters. Open to all radio amateurs, it takes place three times a year and runs for just 12 hours. Yoda said the aim is to boost on-the-air activity by younger radio amateurs and to support Yoda. The contest will take place in three different 12-hour windows on three Saturdays. The opening event will be on May 22nd, 0800 to 1959 UTC. The other two this year will take place on July 17th and December 30th. Yoda has established eight different operating categories, which includes subcategories for operators age 25 and younger, but operators of all ages may participate. Covering 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters, the allowable modes will be CW and SSB. The contest exchange will be the age of the participating operator. Different ages serve as score multipliers during the contest. Stations may work the same station once per band mode. Contacts between stations on the same continent are worth one point, while working DX is worth three points. The most points, though, will be achieved by working the youngest operators. The younger the operator, the more points one will get for the QSO, Yoda said. Winners will be awarded the Yoda Contest plaque. Visit ham-yoda.com forward slash contest. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Youth Working Group is working with Hungary's IARU member society, MRAS, the Hungarian Amateur Radio Society. MRAS is providing a contest log robot, among other things. Submit Cabrillo logs only. Contest winners will be announced once logs received have been checked in the various categories. Winners will be awarded with a YOTA contest plaque. The contest committee consists of the IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group, Philip DK6SP Chair, Marcus DL8GM Vice Chair, and members Saba HA6PX and Tomi HA8RT. Contact the YOTA Contest Committee with any questions or for more information. Here is the Volunteer Monitor Report for March 2021. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the March 2021 Volunteer Monitor Program Report. The FCC delayed action on the renewal application of a general class licensee in Quakertown, Pennsylvania, in order to review allegations of repeated transmission of obscenities and failure to properly identify. The Volunteer Monitor Coordinator issued 14 advisory notices. An advisory notice is an attempt to resolve rule violation issues informally before FCC intervention. An advisory notice was sent to the owner of a remote amateur station in California, advising him that he is responsible for deliberate interference transmitted by any station over his remote facility. An advisory notice was sent to a radio amateur in Ripley, Tennessee, regarding deliberate interference and failure to properly identify on 75 meters. An advisory notice was sent to a radio amateur in Jefferson, Georgia, concerning failure to properly identify on 40 meters. Advisory notices were sent to radio amateurs in Tiburon, Petaluma, and Manteca, California, and Grants Pass, Oregon, concerning interference on 75 meters. General advisories were sent to operators in West Virginia, Michigan, Iowa, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin concerning operation on 7.200, 3.927, and 3.860 MHz. 
A good operator commendation was sent to a husband and wife team in Periopolis, Pennsylvania, recognizing excellent net and two-meter operations. The staff of the volunteer monitoring program had two meetings with FCC officials in March. Following its decision earlier this year to cancel the in-person Dayton Hamvention in May, Hamvention has announced a series of 2021 Hamvention weekend activities, both virtual and on the air. These activities are getting underway with a virtual contest university on Thursday, May 20th, which will be a free event. Even non-contesters may find something to learn at Contest University. Major sponsors include DX Engineering and ICOM America. A list of instructors and presentations is still in the works and should be ready 30 days before the event. The 2021 Hamvention Award winners will be featured in virtual forums on Friday, May 21st. Participation links will be published about 30 days in advance on the Hamvention website. Several online prize drawings are planned and winners must be present online. Presenters will be Hamvention Technical Achievement Winner Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, well known as the Space Weather Woman. Those who have seen her space weather forecasting show say she's full of energy and excited about her work, a real space pioneer. Hamvention Special Achievement Award recipient Wesley Lamboli, W3WL, nominated by his peers for his lifetime of high energy support for the science and art of amateur radio. Not only has he supported youth coaching, membership recruiting, and technical problem assistance, he always does it with a smile and great humor. Hamvention Amateur of the Year, Angel Vasquez, WP3R, known as one of the principal support engineers at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. His award recognizes his unswerving and diligent support of amateur radio throughout Puerto Rico and worldwide. Hamvention Club of the Year, the Vienna Wireless Society, K4HTA, chosen for its 58 years of service to the amateur radio community. The club's 280 members focus on youth education, public service, and promoting the overall growth of radio throughout the D.C. area and around the world. Hamvention General Chairman Rick Allnut, WS8G, has invited all radio amateurs to participate in a 12-hour on-the-air special event, the Hamvention QSO Party. This will take place from 1200 UTC on Saturday, May 22nd, to 0000 UTC on Sunday, May 23rd. To get people in the spirit, the exchange will include the year that you first attended one of the Hamventions, Allnut said in a video interview conducted by Tim Duffy, K3LR, for DX Engineering's YouTube channel. If you haven't ever attended one, then you can use 2021 as the date. Sponsored by the AWRL-affiliated Dayton Amateur Radio Association since 1952, Hamvention is the largest annual in-person ham radio event in the U.S. QSO party participants should look for W8BI, Dayton Amateur Radio Association's club station call sign, which will count for 10 bonus points per band and mode. The Hamvention website offers scoring details and explains how to print a certificate following the QSO party. AWRL Maxim Memorial Station W1AW is planning to join the on-the-air Hamvention celebration. AWRL will also mark the occasion of the traditional Hamvention weekend with some special messages and promotions. Look for details soon. On January 11th, Hamvention announced the cancellation of this year's in-person show for the second year due to the ongoing pandemic. Dayton Hamvention 2022 will tentatively take place May 20th to the 22nd, 2022.
Germany's federal network agency, the BNETSA, that's their regulator, will be billing radio amateurs for €34.52 to cover the cost of providing services in 2017 and 2018. The German National Radio Society, the DARC, says that on March the 30th, the Frequency Protection Contribution Regulation was published in the Federal Law Gazette. This sets out financial contributions for 2017 and 2018 under the Telecommunications Act and the Electromagnetic Compatibility of Equipment Act. Summing the contributions for both years totals €34.52 per ham for the amateur radio service in Germany. Radio amateurs who were assigned a call sign in both years will therefore receive a bill for this amount. Radio amateurs are required to pay this fee. The radio amateurs only have to pay once the contribution notices have been posted by the Federal Network Agency. For each year, the BNET say retrospectively calculates the individual contributions of every type of user of their services, which reflects the relative amount of effort they put into each. Information on this is provided by the Board of Directors on the DARC website. Go to darc.de and you'll be able to see an appendix in which there's a table showing the history of contributions over the past few years. The Military Auxiliary Radio System, better known as MARS, is a U.S. Department of Defense adjunct comprised of radio amateurs. That's not always the first resource that comes to mind in an emergency, even with the military. For more on this story, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters in Newington. In a recent article in Signal, U.S. Marine Corps Major Brian Kerg exhorts the brass to more fully exploit amateur radio in general and Mars in particular for use in times of distress. In short, he'd like to see more ham radio in military training programs. As future threats continue to evolve, day-to-day -day communications architectures will become more unreliable in times of crisis, Kerg concluded. It is imperative that joint communications planners turn to amateurs in order to remain experts. Kerg attempts to raise the amateur radio consciousness level of military planners. He characterizes ham radio as a robust and readily available communications resource when things go south, and every bit as expert as professional military communicators and signalmen. The downside, Kirk said, is that the use of Mars remains a largely unknown or niche capability, one that is usually stumbled upon by planners in a moment of crisis and then poorly implemented. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. By building awareness of how to employ Mars and training military radio operators in ham radio technique, leaders will ensure their planners are proactively leveraging the organic amateur communications networks that abound across the globe. The term amateur refers not to their technical acumen, but to private non-business use of allocated radio bands by those possessing amateur radio licenses, Kirk points out. He notes that while voice communication may be the most common ham radio mode, operators are skilled at sending and receiving text images and various forms of data. With Mars, the Defense Department has a mechanism employing amateur radio operators who can actively support military operations. Notably, Military air crews remain capable of using Mars phone patches through high-frequency radios when satellite communications are unavailable, he writes. He said awareness of Mars was not helped when the Navy and the Marine Corps Mars were shuttered back in 2015, leaving only Army and Air Force Mars. Military planners should focus on raising awareness of Mars and all of amateur radio by making it available through training and other activities, Kirk said. Contesting could be a component. The wide variety of amateur radio competitions can further incentivize military operators to improve their amateur radio skills while inevitably improving proficiency in their mission essential tasks, he wrote. Kirk currently serves as the Fleet Amphibious Communications Officer, the U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Sunday, April 18th is World Amateur Radio Day. This year marks the 96th anniversary of the International Amateur Radio Union, founded at the 1925 International Radio Telegraph Conference in Paris. 
With more details on World Amateur Radio Day, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. ARRL co-founder and first president Hiram Percy Maxim, 1AW, was there. And today, ARRL is the international secretariat of the IARU. IARU has chosen the theme, Amateur Radio, Home But Never Alone, for World Amateur Radio Day 2021. Amateur radio experimenters were the first to discover that the HF spectrum was not a wasteland after all. In the rush to use these shorter wavelengths, however, amateur radio was in grave danger of being pushed aside, prompting the founding of the IARU. Since then, the 25 countries that formed the IARU have grown to include more than 160 member societies in three regions. On World Amateur Radio Day, all radio amateurs are invited to take to the airwaves to share global goodwill with other amateurs. ARRL encourages members to promote the value of amateur radio to family, friends, and community. Coincidentally, the SSB running of the ARRL Rookie Roundup falls on World Amateur Radio Day. The event is aimed at hams licensed for three years or less. Take the opportunity to wish participants happy World Amateur Radio Day 2021 on the air. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. AWRL has resources that members can use to celebrate World Amateur Radio Day including graphics for social media posts and radio club websites, as well as a printable flyer. The IARU has chosen Amateur Radio, Home But Never Alone, as the theme for World Amateur Radio Day 2021. The theme acknowledges that during our physical distancing to reduce the spread of COVID-19, Amateur Radio stands out as a welcome respite for its variety of activities and opportunities. At the 1927 International Radio Telegraph Convention, amateur radio gained allocations still recognized today, 160, 80, 40, 20, and 10 meters. Over the years, the IARU has worked to give all radio amateurs new bands at 136 kilohertz, 472 kilohertz, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 18 megahertz, 24 megahertz, and 50 megahertz and a regional European allocation at 70 MHz, and IARU defends those allocations. IARU Region 1 includes Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and North Asia. Region 2 covers the Americas, and Region 3 is comprised of Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific Island nations, and most of Asia. The International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, has recognized the IARU as representing the interests of amateur radio. Many volunteer AWRL public information officers and public information coordinators throughout the U.S. use the time leading up to World Amateur Radio Day as an opportunity to reach out to the media to share information about amateur radio. The amateur radio community has a great story to tell on the occasion of World Amateur Radio Day. ARRL Product Development Manager Bob Inderbitzen, NQ1R, said, While the pandemic has kept many of us at home, radio amateurs have still been able to get on the air. In June 2020, the ARRL Field Day, held annually as Amateur Radio's largest on-the-air operating event and demonstration, included nearly 19,000 participants, making more than 1.8 million radio contacts in a single weekend. Over the last year, many AWRL-affiliated radio clubs and in-person ham radio events have moved their group activities online. This has helped to keep radio amateurs active and involved in the common pursuit of skill, service, and discovery in radio communication and radio technology, Interbitson added. Here are a few of the World Amateur Radio Day 2021 activities around the globe. In Bahrain, the Amateur Radio Society of Bahrain will operate A91WARD during April 14th through the 18th, 2021, using single sideband, FT8, and DMR modes. In Canada, Radio Amateurs of Canada are sponsoring a Get on the Air World Amateur Radio Day special event. In Germany, the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club is operating DA21WARD for World Amateur Radio Day from April 18th through June 30th, QSL to DK5ON. 
in New Jersey. The Fairlawn New Jersey Amateur Radio Club will operate club station W2NPT on CW and phone throughout the day on April 18th. In support of the theme of this year's event, the operators will share information about the health and welfare net that the club is running during the pandemic. In Alabama, the Disaster Communication Action Team will operate club station KD1CAT on April 18th in support of World Amateur Radio Day. Operation will be on all HF bands. There are also World Amateur Radio Day activities scheduled to take place on Echolink as well. Check the AWRL World Amateur Radio Day page for more information. A two-hour emergency communications exercise on March 19th in Florida was deemed wildly successful while resulting in 21 specific suggestions for improvement of issues recognized. Rick Lundquist, WW1ME, is here with more from League Headquarters. Sponsored by the Florida Baptist Disaster Relief, a non-governmental or NGO-served organization, the Whirlwind Boom Exercise, as it was called, simulated a combined disaster of multiple tornadoes crossing north-central Florida, closely followed by a terrorist attack on telecommunications, taking down large chunks of internet and telephone service. Pop-up situations called injects by invent planners simulated multiple dire situations and hinted at even larger attacks designed to create rumor issues. Multiple counties arranged for volunteers to help with the simulation, working in shelters and transmitting status reports of individualized disaster scenarios to county emergency operations centers. Volunteers directed by actual or simulated EOC officials aggregated situational awareness reports and formulated status and resource request messages sent by voice or digital mode to a volunteer from the actual Florida agency agency that handles disaster communications. Appropriate responses were sent back by radio. All told, 431 messages zipped through the airwaves within the two-hour simulation, including 53 to the state and 31 replies. Messages were passed using digital email or radiogram. A 60-meter interoperability channel was made available. Exercise planning was carried out as much as possible in accordance with DHS Homeland Security Exercise Evaluation Program protocols. The exercise picked up additional support from multiple out-of-state volunteers who relayed traffic from voice to email and vice versa. Amateur Radio also conveyed simulated outbound welfare messages from survivors in stricken cities and counties. Two of the seven exercise goals addressed interoperability between agencies and volunteers. Agency Emergency Management and Communications Groups participating included the Florida Division of Emergency Management, Florida Baptist Disaster Relief, the Federal Share Southeast Regional Net, Alachua, Columbia, Flagler, Madison, and Taylor Counties, as well as Homestead City. Volunteer Communications Groups included the Northern Florida Aries Net, Northern Florida Phone Net, North Florida Phone Traffic Net, and the Aries Groups from Alachua, Columbia, Flagler, Madison, Marion, Santa Rosa, Sewanee and Volusia counties. Madison corralled volunteers from several surrounding counties to expand situational awareness. Multiple county emergency managers injected their own specific plans and overlay exercises as provided by the open exercise design. Ross Merlin, WA2WDT, director of the Federal Shares Program, arranged for a 60 meter interoperability channel to be made available, and leaders from Shares, Southie Regional Net provided coverage that resulted in informal message transfer. Florida Net Trainer Dave Davis, WA4WES, rounded up volunteers to staff multiple voice nets, and he supervised the PSK31 net. Northern Florida Section Emergency Coordinator Carl Martin, K4HBN, also took part. Post-exercise feedback, both through the one-hour Zoom hot wash session and an anonymous feedback form, were very positive and also suggested possible improvements. All are included in the detailed and candid after-action report improvement plan. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. One of the most well-known hams on the air until recently is Art Bell, W6OBB, who for years entertained late-night radio audiences with his excellent guest interviews around the subject of the paranormal and UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Art's show on Coast to Coast AM became the highest rated late night show syndicated on 500 stations nationwide and attracting 15 million listeners. 
Like many who grew up on talk radio as a kid, I loved to listen to Art on long overnight drives around the Southwest. His ham radio story is even older than his broadcast story. Art Bell, W6OBB, is my guest on QSO Today. W6OBB, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Art? 4Z1UG, Eric, this is Art Bell, W6OBB, and Pahrump about how you doing? I'm great, Art. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? How did you become interested in amateur radio? <laughs> um, it is a very long story. I'm now 70 years old, Eric, and I began, um, I'm going to say, I began my interest when I was about 11 or 12, and I would go to my grandma's house, and she had this old, uh, I'd had to stand five feet up, old radio, and it covered the shortwave bands, uh, not sideband, uh, which we didn't even have then, actually, but just AM shortwave, and I would listen around, I'd hear other countries, and I thought it was magic, Eric. So I became more and more interested. I finally ran into a fellow who lived down the street from me. This was in Pennsylvania at the time. And uh, he actually, believe it or not, was a nuclear scientist. However, he in his basement had a full setup and would entice me by having me come over and sit and watch him talk to Europe and around the world. And I was hooked. I mean, I was hook, line, and sinker hooked. So he slowly trained me to become a novice, and I took my test, and my first uh, rig was a Heathkit AT1 transmitter, which was crystal controlled and good for about 30 watts on a good day. And, um, and so I got on, and that's how it happened. I think I was uh, licensed either when I was 11 or 12, no, I'm going to say 12 or 13, I'm sorry, 12 or 13, either late 12 or early 13, and um, that's all I did. I would sit in my room, and I would operate day and night. I uh, didn't particularly enjoy CW, I still don't, but I, I, I know it. For some reason, CW came easily to me. It's strange, because I don't, I don't really like CW, but it came easily to me. I'm one of those people, I guess. And do you remember what your first call sign was? Oh, sure. No, who would ever forget that? KN3JOX, licensed in uh, in Pennsylvania, Media Pennsylvania. And uh, gosh, uh, that really brings back memories. So KN3JOX became K3JOX as I obtained my, my general. And then uh, finally I became, I've not had that many calls in my life, uh, Eric, I became W2CKS. Got very lucky when I moved uh, into the two area. And so I got a pretty good call, W2CKS. Then finally, as an adult, I wanted to live on the west coast of the U.S., so away I went. And I, I believe I sent a letter with my license, Eric, and I begged to get a W call because I had been lucky enough to get one uh, in the two call area. So I literally begged <laughs> the FCC. <laughs> and sure enough, they came back, believe it or not, and uh, gave me W6OBB. And I have had that ever since. So we're talking about from the age of 12 or 13 to 70. And uh, never not been a ham. Never not had a rig that was working and operable. Now, you're, a, you're an extra-class licensee. When did you upgrade to extra-class? What happened is I was a general. Uh, I then, in San Diego, California, as I mentioned, I went to the West Coast, took uh, the advanced class, and I became an advanced for a lot of years. Um, I thought it was sort of a badge of honor because an advanced class license, you know, indicates that you did pass the CW test. So... There you have it. For the general. I, uh, yeah, well, right. Um, so I passed the advanced and uh, kept that for years. And then finally, when the commission came out with the new allocations and, you know, the extras were given so much more bandwidth on bands that I love, like 75 meters, I finally was pushed over the edge and went and took my extra and passed it. Oh, there you go. Now, you mentioned that you had the Heathkit AT1 as your first rig. Do you remember what the receiver was? Sure. The AC-3. 
Uh, also a Heathkit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, I can tell you a funny little story about that. Um, I, of course, needed a receiver. I got the transmitter and then needed a receiver. So I ordered that from Heathkit. And I was not what you would call a technician at that point. I, I, in other words, I didn't know a lot of technical stuff. So when I got the Heath kit, I got all the parts out like everybody does, didn't read the instructions the way I was supposed to, Eric. And so I didn't know that I was supposed to shorten lead length. My assumption was that all capacitors and resistors had to be the length they were given to me as. So I didn't shorten any lead lengths. Now, I built the entire, <laughs> built the entire thing, and you can well imagine uh, capacitors and uh, resistors were you know, sticking out like spaghetti uh, from the bottom. And I had built it uh, correctly with that exception. So when I finally proudly slid this thing into its case and turned on the power, it sort of caught on fire because as, as you can imagine, all the resistors and capacitors meshed together and uh, it was a pretty big disaster. So uh, I finally realized my, the error of my ways. I redid the whole thing and God bless it worked. And what kind of antenna did you use in, as your, on your novice rig? <laughs> um, I, yeah, these really are things you never forget. It was just a long wire, a 65-foot long wire. Uh-huh, with a tu NFED tuner or something like that. Uh, I had a, uh, well, the Heathkit AT1 uh, lent itself to a long wire antenna. You know, there was one mm -hmm. screw there, and that was it. So. Oh, on the output, yeah. Yeah. No coax output on that. Oh, that no. Radio. No, 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 no. Not that I recall. Maybe there was, but I, I don't recall it. I just recall a single wire attachment point, and, uh, and I, I used a long wire in the beginning. After the first mentor that you had in Pennsylvania, did you have any other Elmers or mentors that kind of helped you along? Um, when we'd be riding down the street, and by that I mean when I would be in my mom's car and we'd be headed somewhere, I would uh, typically see an antenna, and I'd go, Mom, stop, stop. And we'd stop at the antenna, and I would uh, go and knock on the door, you know, and I'd meet the ham, and inevitably, inevitably, whoever it was would hand me some piece of equipment that he didn't want anymore and say, God bless you, son, see you later. So I don't know about metters, but donations I did receive. <laughs> Anything like really spectacular that you received as a donation? Um, no, slow additions to the shack, uh, little things, clocks, um, occasionally and another rig of one sort or another. I think I had a Halicrafters receiver that only changed frequency slightly when you touched the desk. And, you know, I, I slowly moved up in the world. I think I went pretty much through the Heathkit line, Eric. I went from a AT1 to a, uh, a DX20, uh, a DX40, a DX60, and then finally an Apache. So that takes you pretty quickly through my my early days. I You know, I couldn't afford a lot. Uh, so... That's what I had. I, I loved the Apache. It was plate modulated, sounded like a million dollars. And, you know, that, that sort of, I hate to rush you through all those days, but uh, I was on the air every day, mostly all day to my mother's dismay and um, enjoying myself. I have always loved seven, lower bands, 75 and 40, because, you know, you can kind of hook up with people that you met the day before or last week and pretty reliably know that you'll be talking to them again and uh, meet up with them on the band. Um, I also did, as a young ham, operate an awful lot of the, uh, the higher bands. And as I do today, I operate all bands. So, God, I had a blast when I was a kid, uh, Eric. And I, I mentioned to my mother's dismay, I think she thought I was overdoing it. I'm sure I was. But ham radio then is quite quickly what led me into broadcast radio. So we'll go there in just a minute, Art. But let me ask a question, because it sounds to me like your your parents were quite supportive of your hobby. I mean, they might have complained that maybe you were infatuated with it. Mine did 
What kind of impact did amateur radio have or and still have on your family life? I guess my ham hobby has impacted um, my family life all my life. I mean, uh, and I've, I've had a, a couple of families, Eric, so sure, it's always impacted it. There was never a time that I didn't devote one room of whatever abode I was in to amateur radio. And, and that includes today, I'm sitting in the shack right now. So it's impacted my family life always. And uh, my mom was afraid that uh, it would lead to no good things for me. Uh, quite to the contrary, it, it led to my eventual career. I found that as I, as I entered my career in broadcasting, Eric, and I know it's rushing you a little bit to get you there already, but what I found is that I got eternal connections. In other words, there's amateur radio is kind of a brotherhood. Yes. And once you walk in a place and you're applying for a job or something like that, and the other fellow mentions that he's a ham, you can almost know it's a lock. I mean, not absolutely, but the brotherhood has always taken care of its own, Eric, and uh, it certainly took care of me. I was only 13 years old when I finally, uh, toward the end of 13, w went and got a commercial first-class radio telephone license. So there you go. I, you know, I, I went from ham radio and never left ham radio, not one day in all these years. And then I entered uh, the broadcast realm. And I did so pretty much in engineering, but quickly moved on to on-the-air work. And I, I'm telling you, Eric, and this is truth, and I suspect it's still pretty much true today, that if you mention you're a ham, and uh, the, the guy sitting across the desk from you is a ham, you probably got a lock on the job. So ham radio has served me all my life. I, it's it's not just a hobby. It's an absolute love. Yeah, boy, I got that. Here you are, a 13-year-old with a first-class radio telephone license. Well, what happened there? You know, you've, <laughs> you, you've got ham radio. Um, it's opening doors for you. Did it influence, um, it obviously influenced career, but did it also influence education? Um, yes, I, I, I think it's fair to say yes. Uh, although uh, I have a limited formal education, some college, I don't think it propelled me, in, you know, toward a further educational goal of some sort. I wanted to get in radio, Eric, and I, and by radio I mean commercial broadcasting. And so I would go to the local radio station, whatever that was. We moved around a lot as I was uh, a child, Eric. My mom and dad were both Marines. My mother was a uh, one of the first women Marines in the country, and uh, she was a drill instructor, if you can believe that, at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. My dad is a retired colonel, was a retired colonel from the uh, Marine Corps, and I was born on Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. So you can imagine I had fairly strict parents. At any rate, I began going to hang out as much as they would let me at local radio stations, meeting the disc jockeys, meeting the engineers, going ooh and ah at uh, the 3500 uh, or 3400 I guess it was transmitters and you know digging into stuff and, and just doing everything I could at a radio station whether it was engineering or it was air work or bringing somebody their coffee what have you I, I did that endlessly as a child and uh, every day literally every day Eric I was either on ham radio or at some radio station trying to figure out what I could learn and glean and whether I could get a job. Well, we've had a number of guests on the QSO Today podcast who were engineers at radio stations as kids because, you know, the, the kids with a first-class license walks in the door and he's, you know, he's got the job. But not many of them, you know, end up on the air except maybe because there's a spot in the middle of the night to fill and uh, the, the station manager says, well, why don't you fill it, read the news or something like that. <laughs> How did you end up on the air? Well, I'm laughing because uh, that ultimately is exactly how I ended up with my big career in radio. You know, somebody who said, well, I guess we're going to have to put you on at night. 
but that's a story for down line, I guess, a little bit. I, I started, as I mentioned, to finally get jobs. You know, I guess I had a decent voice, and I landed a job at a station in little FM religious station in Franklin, New Jersey. And to get to work, I had to climb this mountain. I mean, it was literally on the mountain. Instead of just putting the antenna on the mountain, the whole thing was there. It was a religious FM station, Eric, and all I did was read the news every hour. But I stayed there full time to do it. And uh, the man who owned and ran the station was of an unusual sort. Uh, he had a thing about people who get too close to the microphone. He liked my news, but he thought I got too close to the mic. And uh, so in the middle of a five-minute newscast, he would walk into the studio, grab the back of the chair, and yank it out from under me. And, and right on the air, you would hear me take a tumble onto the floor, and he'd start ranting at me. And needless to say, I, I didn't stay for a long time at that FM station. But that's kind of start I had, kind of rough start, I guess I had. And then from that point, Eric, I, I was looking toward, you know, I'm a kid, so I'm looking toward rock and roll radio. And I did secure some jobs at some rock stations. Uh, I'm talking about top 40 here. And um, it did pretty well, actually did pretty well. And then I finally said, ah, the heck with this. I'm going to go in the Air Force. So I... I took a break from everything, went into the Air Force, all set for a radio career, and uh, they said, no, uh, it looks like you're going to go into, brace yourself, Eric, medicine. So I became a, a medic. I went to Amarillo Air Force Base after basic training in San Antonio and uh, was a medic and then made my way to the Far East. Inevitably, you can guess the years touched down in uh, Okinawa, spent a lot of time in Okinawa, Eric, uh, on Okinawa, and uh, of course Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, and spent a lot of time in the Far East. Now, when I left the Air Force, I did four years and out, uh, Eric, when I left the Air Force, I had fallen in love with the island of Okinawa. And so I wrote a letter. There was a commercial broadcast station at that time. We administered the island of the Ryukyu Islands were administered by the U.S. Eric. And so there was a commercial broadcast station owned by an Okinawan company, Ryukyu Hoso, actually. I wrote them a letter. They had a rock and roll station that served the GIs on the island. At that time, that was about a quarter of a million if you included the dependents. And... I got an answer, and they said, come on to Okinawa. We're going to pay your way, and you can, you can do air work. And so I spent a total of 10 years, Eric, on the island of Okinawa. Wow. Yeah. You're a handy guy. So you, were you also the um, station engineer as well as the uh, on-air talent? No, no, no. That was all Okinawans. But it was quite an experience. I fell in love with the Far East, Eric. I remember... We had an old teletype machine in a little soundproof room. And the only way that one could get news would be to pick it up by radio. I think there were two or three different frequencies, but it came from the U.S. by radio. And so if you can imagine, uh, you know, the selective fading that was coming from California, which is where the signal was coming from all the way to Okinawa, <laughs> typically halfway through a story, uh, it would go into a selective fade, and you would have complete garble. So you couldn't just run into this little room and rip. You had to read as well. If you didn't read, you'd get halfway through a story, and it'd go in total garble. So that's how we got our news from the Associated Press halfway across the world. Do you remember the station call letters? Sure. KSBK. KSBK. Yes, Kilowatt Sugar Bravo Kilowatt about that. And I was a ham there, of course. I was a ham everywhere. I was KR6BK. What did you schlep along with you as, as far as ham radio gear when you were in Okinawa? It wasn't so much a matter of schlepping. Uh, for example, to Okinawa, I took very nearly nothing to Okinawa and bought the rig that I wanted, which at that time I believe was a Tempo 
bought it and lived in a little Japanese house with, at that time, a cute little Japanese girl and had, uh, I constructed my antenna on the roof from bamboo and my brilliant idea, Eric, was to take long sections of bamboo uh, and cover them with aluminum foil, which is not bad. Actually, Eric worked very well, and uh, you can create uh, uh, dipoles from that. You can create uh, beams from that. You can do a whole lot, Eric, with bamboo and aluminum foil. And so that's the way I operated for any number of years as KR6BK on the island of Okinawa. And uh, those were pretty good condition times. Uh, you could typically work any day you wanted into California, no problem at all. So what brought you, what brought you back to the United States? Um, my radio career. Now, if you want to get anywhere in radio, probably Okinawa as a launching point career-wise is not the ideal place. So if you ever really want to get anywhere, you've got to come back to the continental United States and begin, uh, be, begin getting on bigger and bigger and bigger radio stations. And that's exactly what I did. I slowly climbed the ladder of rock and roll in those days and uh, enjoyed it very much. Now, I was up and down the dial, like WKRP, for example, I was in so many states and I kept moving to a slightly bigger, slightly bigger, slightly bigger radio station and spent about total of, oh, I would guess 20 years, Eric, doing rock and roll. Uh, that first class radio telephone license served me well and got me in a lot of doors that would not have opened otherwise. I did quite a bit of actual engineering, considered myself to be a pretty decent audio engineer and um, was hired by some stations to just work on their audio chains and would travel and do that. Now, what I really loved was being on the air, Eric, and um, so I, I did pretty well. I went uh, not all the way as far as one might go in the rock and roll world, but uh, I was uh, almost almost got a job in New York City actually auditioned for WABC in New York. Didn't make it, but auditioned. Worked for Extra uh, down in Tijuana. Uh, worked for New Haven, WAVZ, which in those, in that, at that particular time was a pretty decent job, to be honest with you. And um, so up and down the dial and uh, did about 20 years total of rock and roll. And then one day, Eric, Somebody asked me if I thought I could do talk, if I, if I thought I could do a talk show. Uh, this was up in Anchorage, Alaska at K-E-N-I. Pretty good sized station in Anchorage, actually, Eric. And uh, so I did a talk show, and it was immensely successful. And uh, then I came back to the lower part of the U.S. Again, this is really where the action is. Worked in the uh, Monterey area doing talk. Yeah, and, well, what did you talk about? Because it's my, it's my understanding that you actually changed gears in talk. Oh, I did. I began in talk radio the way everybody in those days began, and that was uh, with political talk radio. And uh, so I talked politics. I I don't care. I got interested in it. It was fun. You could have on the air fights. <laughs> you know, it was pretty wild. So that's what I did. And then, then I took a break. After all these years in radio, uh, I was married at the time. It was no life because you had to keep moving from town to town and again, up and down the dial, right? No sort of life to uh, uh, continue with. So I said, okay, that's it. I'm getting out of radio. I went to work uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada for a cable company, and um, I became their chief technician. I built their what's called their head end. That's where all the video processors are. Uh, it's where all the satellite antennas are. It's where the, uh, the microwave shots are, cars band microwave. Pretty big facility, actually, uh, Eric. And I worked my way up. I be became the chief technician after I built everything, and I took care of it for a number of years. When I was building that facility, Eric, I loved it. 
I mean, it was all technical stuff. I was off to school at Hughes uh, AML Microwave and learning all sorts of new things and doing all sorts of new things, and every day was a new adventure. Unfortunately, after I built it and I had a large crew of people working for me, I began to get bored, Eric, sitting around waiting for something to break, very well paid, uh, frankly, but um, I don't know, started to get boring. So one day I got a call from a friend of mine whose name is, was Jack Daniels, I think he may still be around, and he was working at KDWN in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, it's a, it was, and I believe still is, a talk station. Now, it's a 50,000-watt blowtorch on 720 in Las Vegas. And he said, ah, well, come on, you, I, I know I heard you did talk. Come on over. You don't have to take the job. Just do a talk show uh, every morning during the week with me, and let's see how you like it. Well... You know, it was like a hook with a worm on it, and I, I bit really hard. I did do that talk show for about six months, Eric, during the day. And, of course, 50,000 watts is good, but from Las Vegas, after it covers Las Vegas, it goes out to the desert and stops, right? You know, it, you can only go so far in the desert even with 50,000 watts. So after about six months... I knew this is what I wanted, Eric, and um, I went to my wife at the time, and I told her that I was going to give up this really well-paying job, and I was going to go and be on the radio. Well, she that kind of did in my marriage, Eric. She, she thought I was absolutely out of my mind. I mean, I had a high-paying job, every benefit you could imagine, lots of security. I had built the, the cable company. And I went to them and told them I was going to walk away, uh, begin working, well, not for peanuts, but peanuts. For less. Not, not, <laughs> not, it would be peanuts plus not much. Um, and she, she thought I was crazy. And ultimately, uh, you know, that cost me the marriage. But I went to work for KWN. And every minute I was there, Eric, I had my eye. You mentioned the nighttime. I had my eye on the nighttime, because while 50,000 watts goes out and covers, you know, Las Vegas, which is great, uh, after that, it's just cactus. But, aha, at night, even though slightly directional, KDWN covered 13 states at night. 13 states. So, that would be regarded as a clear channel station, right? Uh, as close as you can get. There really aren't any exact clear channels left, but yes, uh huh, that's right. And um, every night at sunset, we would have to uh, throw a couple of switches and go directional. I think we were protect protecting uh, WGN in Chicago. Uh, by the way, Eric, I, I can't tell you how many nights I came within... I actually had my finger on the button. I, I, I worked at KWN, Eric, for a total of 10 years. I worked uh, late nights. I came to work at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, I would go on the air uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'd frequently be on the air until 6 o'clock in the morning doing talk radio. And again, in the beginning, it was absolutely uh, political. So. I did that for a long time and really, really, really enjoyed myself and did very well uh, in the ratings. But I, just for the hams out there, I thought I'd tell you, Eric, there were about 10 or 15 times that I actually went over to the console, put my finger on the switch that would turn us non-directional because I wanted to see if I could get calls from other parts of the country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I came within just that much of turning that baby non-directional. I can't tell you how many times, but, you know, I was in mortal fear of the Federal Communications Commission, and I'm, I was sure they would come marching in and chop my head off within minutes. So I never did do it. I'm kind of still sorry I didn't, frankly. So what happened, Eric, is here I am pretty successful doing this nighttime show. 
uh, being heard across the 13 states as advertised, getting a lot of calls. And one day I got bored with politics. I said, ah, not another night, not another five hours of politics. Oh, no. So I had a friend. Uh, you may have heard the name or know the name Lear, as in Learjet. Well, John Lear is the son of the man who put together and owned Learjet, John Lear. And John has some unusual ideas about virtually everything, including UFOs, including Area 51 that I'm very close to uh, as I speak to you right now, and the things that have gone on out there. So I thought, you know, I wonder what will happen. Now, now, bear in mind, the owners of KWN were conservatives. They ran that as a conservative radio station. Anything else was heresy. So I thought, well, just one night. Let me give it a try. And I, I had John Lear on. I thought, how interesting would it be to talk about Area 51, to talk about UFOs, to talk about all sorts of different things. So I had him on. And that was the beginning of the end, Eric. I began getting so many calls that, uh, well, we had an 800 line. Back, that was back in the days when you had to have an 800 line. If you wanted out-of-state calls, that's how you got them. And I kept doing these kinds of topics. And about a month into it, Eric, of course, my boss was going totally berserk, uh, not wanting me to do this ordering me not to do this, threatening to fire me. And by the way, they did fire me, I think, three and perhaps four times. Problem was, Eric, the ratings were so good. I mean, during the day, the radio station had virtually no ratings. At night, when I was on, we were number one. Everybody loved it. Well, everybody except the owners. They hated it absolutely hated it. I mean, you can imagine uh, some very staunch conservatives uh, trying to answer to their friends how their radio station was talking about UFOs and things of that sort at night. It drove them crazy. About what year was this? Uh, this would have been probably the mid to, let's see, by the time we were talking about this sort of thing, it would have been the mid nineties, mid nineties. Uh, so I, I was, I was taken in there and fired at least four times, Eric, and uh, then almost immediately rehired. I remember one day that uh, somebody came to me and said, uh, "Art, we love your show. the The Concord, the Supersonic uh, Concord, is going to be." in Las Vegas, and then making a trip to Paris, France. And guess what? We're going to get you and the lady friend of your choice on to the Concord uh, and go to Paris. And so I went to the lady who owns the show, uh, the station rather, and I said, look, I've got this chance to go to Paris for free on the Concord. Supersonic, one of the last flights, actually, Eric. And I'm going to go. It means I'm going to miss a night, maybe two nights of radio. And she said, no. I said, okay, then. I quit. She said, you're fired. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, I left. I went to Paris. I had a ball. I came back home and got immediately rehired. And, okay, so I spent a total of uh, 10 years at that radio station, two or three of them talking about UFOs and the paranormal and weird stuff, Eric. And it was so much fun. It was so different. And from that, I began to get uh, syndicated. You know, I began to suddenly show up in Phoenix. Um, I had a fellow who syndicated me. So I, then I was in L.A., then I was uh, in Seattle, then I was in Portland. Then I began going east. And before you know it, I think I was on about 530 radio stations, something like that. So... Radio has treated me very, very well, Eric. I would, I would say to anybody out there, a ham, anybody interested in radio, if this is what you're going to do, then, uh, th then good luck. I, you know, you mentioned the, the late night thing. Um, I actually felt guilty after a while, Eric, because 
you know, the fact that I was so successful um, at that time working for Premier Radio Network's Clear Channel uh, Corporation, that if I'm on 530 radio stations, I am taking jobs away from 530 people, and they're probably starter-type jobs. And so I actually felt guilty about that. But Right, in the middle of the night. I, I think that's where I actually first heard you was um, I used to fly into cable systems that I operated in the Midwest in the 90s and um, would have to drive from like the St. Louis airport, you know, out into uh, Indiana or or uh, Illinois. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you, and there, were, there you were there you are, know, on the radio in the middle of the night. Yeah, there I was indeed. And um, so I guess people can look me up on QRZ, but I'm still at this time a very, very active ham. Uh, Eric, I guess I should add that I, I had yet another pretty good DX experience. I'm married to a Filipina lady, beautiful Filipina lady. And I ended up, uh, after the wife I was married to uh, some years ago in 2006, uh, passed away. Very sad. Um, I met this Filipina lady. And I decided, ah, oh, what the heck, I'm going to the Philippines. So met her after talking with her for a long time and decided, well, you know what? Why don't I live in the Philippines for a while? That should be fun. Uh, this is as I'm, let's see, 65 years old. No, 62 years old. And so I spent, I guess I've spent a total of three or four years in the Philippines, uh, Eric. And again, uh, ham radio was with me. I had uh, all kinds of good radios in the Philippines, got them over there by hook or crook, and more times than not, it's crook because uh, it's not easy getting them in over there. The Philippines is still sort of operated by a bit of graft here and there, so you have to grease a palm uh, to get in what you want to get in, which is what I did. I had a condo, Eric. Uh, in fact, I still own that condo up on the 19th floor, 19 of 20 floors, in Manila. I actually, I guess I should hang my head when I say this, uh, in order to get on the air, I snuck up to the roof of our condominium, very modern, very nice, sort of unreeled a rope until my wife could get her hands on it, tied a coax onto the rope and uh, had her yank, you know, pull it on down into the window if you can imagine on this modern condo, here's the uh, here's the coax going up to the roof, and I snuck an antenna up there. I was at the very, very peak of the roof. They had no idea it was there, Eric, uh, just a dipole to begin with. And uh, finally, they, they about had cats and dogs when they saw it. They got hold of their lawyer, made me take it down. Uh, about a year later, I did manage to get a real antenna up there, a 2-meter 440, which was great, and a multiband uh, dipole. Ultimately, however, even though I caused not one moment of angst nor problem for of any sort, I was ordered to take it down by the board of directors and uh, their attorney, and so I had to take it down. And that's really why I came back to the U.S. But while I was over there, I took the test. Uh, Eric, and became 4F1AB, 4 Foxtrot 1 Alpha Bravo. Uh, and you can only do that when you originally get to the Philippines. I, I, they dubbed me DU1 slash W6OBB. And I got so sick of saying that that I studied for the Philippine test, the highest class test they've got, and passed it. And that's how I became 4F1AB. A lot easier to say than DU1 slant W6OBB. And I operated from there until, as I mentioned, the lawyer made me take the antennas down. And this will give you a sense of how much I love ham radio. When they told me I had to take my antennas down, Eric, I said, okay then, goodbye. <laughs> I would have stayed in the Philippines to this very day, Eric, uh, if they had uh, allowed me my antennas. I had delivered unto them, and it was my fault. You know, I had the multiband antenna and the 2 meter 440 antenna, and all was well. And then I thought, well, okay, if I got that, then why don't I get an engineer? They love 
local engineer. So I got a local engineer who designed a tower and a tri-band antenna beam uh, along with a dipole. And all of this well-designed, paid for, submitted it to the board of directors. Board of directors said, oh, we didn't know you had an antenna up there. Not only can you not have this, but you've got to take down what you've got up. And I was devastated. And so that's how my wife and I decided to come back to the U.S. Were you involved with the ham radio community there? And what did you think? Uh, I was. I think that they're uh, quite a nice bunch, actually. And uh, they've got unusual operating habits uh, as compared to the U.S. I I'll tell you a funny story. When I first got my antenna up, uh, Eric, I would listen every day during the day, during the morning and afternoon to 20, 15, and 10 meters, hoping upon hope for an opening of some kind. This is before we had the recent uh, uptick in conditions. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't hear a thing. The bands were shut down tight as a drum. And so one night I went in there, had to be about, I think it was seven, eight o'clock at night, something like that. The sun at that latitude reliably goes down at six o'clock. Anyway, suddenly 20, 15, and a few signals were there on 10 meters at eight o'clock at night. And I went, what? Well, it turns out, Eric, that down at that latitude, that part of the world, those bands strangely open up at night. And so I had been checking day in and day out, not hearing a thing, and suddenly I discovered they were open at night, and away I went. Amazing. It is. Could, could we go back to broadcast radio for just a second? Sure. Can. Art? sure. Um, broadcast radio and talk radio, it seems, has kind of morphed over time. Can you speak about the changes that you see in the industry and where live talk is headed? <laughs> I think that live talk, Eric, is going to be fine. Where it's headed, you know, that's a harder question. Uh, I think that uh, here in the U.S., AM radio is on its way out, Eric. I think it's on the way out. Uh, I think it's going to be replaced by the digital modes. And uh, th that process is well underway. Now, talk, it's just talk. It will always be around. It's a matter of how it's delivered. So I think that a lot of what's on AM now is going to shift to FM in the U.S. I, I can't speak for, you know, the worldwide situation here in the U.S. It's going to go to FM, and there it will be for a period of time. And then finally, I think uh, everything's going to move to the digital modes. I mean, here we, we all carry around these phones that at this point in my career, I consider all those phones kind of like, you know, little portable radios of old. How frequently now does one go down the street and see somebody holding a portable radio up to their ear the way you did when, uh, well, when I was young anyway, Eric? That was a frequent sight. Now it's uh, the phone they're holding or little, you know, earbuds plugged in listening as they stroll down the street. So the world is changing and these little phones are the new portable radios. What do you think of podcasting and its ability to attract like a worldwide audience? Well, podcasting is still not caught up to radio, but it's catching up quickly. And, um, of course, my most recent effort, something called Midnight in the Desert, was done as a, I won't say as a podcast, uh, Eric, because I did it live. But then, of course, we would uh, allow people for a small fee to purchase copies of the show later. And so what do I think of it? I love it. You can do high quality work. You can do it live. You can do it uh, uh, and make money. I think that it's got a, a wonderful future. What, what's next for Art Bell professionally? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I never know, Eric, professionally. Uh, I may go back and uh, do, I think, I think I'm probably going to end up doing a weekly show instead of trying to do it five nights a week which uh that's a lot uh, eric uh, at my age that's a lot so i may end up uh doing one or two shows a week something like that just you know kind of keep my hand in well if you're doing a podcast art it wouldn't be hard for you to attract an audience i think you know at your peak you had 15 million listeners oh, yeah. you know on a night when you were on 530 syndicated stations so uh correct yeah i look forward to your podcast i was a time traveler and uh a time traveler is someone who um pays 
for the podcast version, which is what I liked uh, when I, when you were on up until December. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we had a problem here. Uh, we had somebody who either did not want me on the air or has a personal grudge and uh, took a shot at me. Um, that that was kind of discouraging. I, I don't like getting shot at it. I had that experience uh, when I was young, and that was enough for me. So somebody took a pot shot at me. I, I don't I, – I had several bad experiences, and so I stopped doing the uh, – We'll call it a podcast for the sake of conversation. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to do a show or two a week, Eric. I'm, you know, born into radio, and I'm sure until my last day I'll be doing it. On your QRZ page, you show an elaborate farm of wire antennas in your desert location. Oh, yes. What antennas do you have on your property? (laughs) Um, Well, I've got a 100-foot radio tower, single tower. And on that tower, I've got a a KLM log periodic. I've got a 6-meter beam. I've got a 2-meter 440-1200 antenna at the very top. And then I use that 100-foot tower as the main support uh, for my very, very large antenna. I think I may have the largest private loop antenna, actually double loop, made of number 10 wire, that completely encircles a five-acre piece of land. And it's a, uh, it's a, what can I say, it's kick-butt antenna. There's, I believe that its actual resonant point, believe it or not, is 640 down in the AM dial. And again, it's made of number 10 wire. It's a double loop uh, separated, the wires are separated by about seven feet. It was inspired by W6AM. I don't know if you know that, that call sign. Sure, I do. Sure, okay. Uh, read his book, and that inspired my antenna. The antenna is held up by a total of 13 towers. And uh, those towers are about 76 feet tall apiece. Again, each one supporting this double loop. And it's an amazing antenna, Eric. I don't know what to tell you. It's simply amazing. It'll make 100 watts sound like several thousand. It's that effective. And and I put it up mainly for 160, 80, and 40. I really, really love 160 meters. I love 75 meters. And I spent a great deal of um, of time on 75. And I, I want to talk briefly, if I can, Eric, about my lost love. And when I say lost love, that's 75 meters. Uh, there are some pretty uh, bad actors on 75 meters uh, here in the U.S., Eric, uh, bo- both, I believe, on the East Coast and the West Coast. We suffer a particular uh, dysfunction here on the West Coast of people who seem more like they want to harm ham radio than they do, as they claim, help it. They use bad language. They have bad manners. They are not what I would call part of the fraternity of amateur radio. Now, the commission has made some recent moves to try and clean some of this up. But frankly, it has not yet been cleaned. And as a result, I built this. God, I don't know how much I spent on that antenna, Eric. I bet I bet I spent $20,000 total on that antenna. And it was to have fun on 75 meters. But fun for me does not include bad language. It does not include jamming. It does not include the bad behavior that you can see exhibited up and down the 75 meter and to some degree the 40 meter band, to some degree even the 20 meter band. Uh, so I'm not sure what's, what's happened to uh, amateur radio, to hams that once were well behaved and part of a fraternity. I don't know what's going on, Eric. Well, I seem to remember in the 70s when I got started, even when I was a novice, I used to listen to 80 meters at night in California. And um, I think there was even that stuff going on then. There was. There was. But to a far lesser degree, we have become somewhat of a less civil society in the U.S. And and I guess it's a reflection of the, you know, the less less civil society. That's all I can say. Uh, But I hope the uh, commission cleans it up and uh, they're making noises as though they may do so. One wonders, though, because it seems as though the FCC here in the U.S. is doing less enforcing, closing offices, and not doing, well, frankly, what 
people like myself hoped they would do. Yeah, you would think, considering what the FCC charges for channels, you know, when they sell Spectrum at auction, <laughs> that they would, um, you know, put some of that money back into into their enforcement uh, division. Yes, well, uh, they don't. I, you know, there there was a day when you had to, you actually got charged if you wanted a ham license. Uh, when you applied for a license, you had to pay a certain fee. They eliminated that fee. And I always thought that, well, maybe that had something to do with the fact that no money was going into enforcement. I don't know, but I would gladly pay whatever to see that enforcement is done. And I don't know, it's just kind of discouraging. And so as a result, I don't go on the 75 meter band and very rarely now on 40. So I built all of that and it sits up there to a large degree unused because of the kind of behavior I just talked about. Um, one hopes one day that will change. Do you see yourself going back to CW or the digital modes or anything like that? No, as I mentioned to you, um, CW was an interesting thing for me. I used it, of course, every day, every hour <laughs> that I was awake as a novice. And it was it came to me very easily, but it always struck me as a, frankly, slow way to communicate. You know, I'm a talker. What can I say? I'm a talker. So I prefer AM. I prefer sideband, uh, which, of course, I'm on now. And I prefer, uh, for example, I'm very much into high-fidelity audio. And uh, the commission and I have had go-arounds about that because when I say high-fidelity audio, I'm thinking of, of four kilohertz type audio, which can be made to sound virtually pretty close to a you know a broadcast type signal uh, if you work at it it's it's just another aspect of the hobby and I worry that the AWRL uh, would like to see us get more and more narrow uh, if they had their way I think we'd be uh, uh, we'd be transmitting nothing over about a kilohertz wide <laughs> do you have an AM uh, broadcast transmitter on 160 or or 80? No, re to retask? No, I, I don't. I, of course, many for many years had exactly that. Uh, right now, what I've got is what most people or many people would have if they had the money. I've got a Yaesu FTDX uh, 9000 Delta. I've got an ICOM 7800. I've got an Alpha 77 uh, amp. And then I've got really good antennas. So I, I get out really well, really well. That sounds great. If you were looking back on your younger ham radio self, is there anything that you would have done differently or something that you would, in the hobby, that you would pursue that you're not pursuing now? No, I don't think so. I, I've stuck my hand in almost every aspect of the hobby. I mean, I've been on, you know, I went through the slow scan uh, television phase. I went into fast scan television. Uh, I've been into the various digital modes. Uh, so I've, I've sort of examined every aspect of uh, ham radio I can. We sent radios up on balloons. We've done all sorts of fun things. It, it, it's never ending. This is one hobby that will continue to deliver the fun your entire life. I, I'm not sure how many hobbies can make that claim, but this one certainly can. Well, I think you're right. Is there any advice you would give to new or returning hams to the hobby? Um, that's an interesting question. What advice would I give? You know, I, I, I worry a little bit that the medium that you and I are using right now, the internet, Eric, may supplant ham radio to some degree. But, you know, for me, and I can only make my own claim, um, there is still the magic of radio going through the air. No matter how good the internet gets, it's not doing it through the air. So what would my advice be? Uh, I guess... It would be discover the magic of radio going through the air because we do have the internet. It's convenient. You and I can talk at thousands of miles and it sounds great, but it's not going through the air. So if you really want to know what radio is all about, ham radio is the way to find out. Yeah, I usually tell people that when we're using Skype, we're only using a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure <laughs> you know, <laughs> to talk to from one end of the world to the other. But a ham can throw a piece of wire out the back window and talk around the world. That's right. I hope that sort of magical thinking uh, uh, continues, Eric. Uh, I worry again that uh, the Internet, as, as you point out, uh, seems to be what's attracting young people. But I still, Eric, I still run into young people, even people who are into the Internet, who look at a radio and they go, oh, my God, 
you can talk to people around the world on that? Yes, I can. Want to see? <laughs> Do you have neighborhood kids that show an interest in ham radio where you are? We do have neighborhood kids. It's been a long time since I mentored anybody. My wife has a license. Uh, she was licensed also in the Philippines, took the test and passed. But, you know, as most wives, I think she did it because she knew it would please me, not because the hobby electrified her as it has me all my life. Yeah, I get that. Well, Art, it's been a true pleasure to have you on as a guest on the QSO Today podcast and um, with that, I want to thank you very much and wish you 73. 73, Eric, and thank you. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Let's see. Well, huh. Let's see what's going on in the world around us. According to a study from Ireland... Irish studies are always so. I like it too. So very interesting. The Trinity College of Dublin has raised fresh privacy concerns about smartphones, saying Android handsets and iPhones share data with their respective companies, Google and Apple, or I guess Samsung, I don't know, on average every four and a half minutes. Data about its their use being sent back even when idle in a pocket or a handbag. Then, but if you read a little farther, you note in the study, it's got the implication, the headline in the Irish Times, smartphones share our data every four and a half minutes. The implication being there's not much difference between Android and iPhones, except the study noticed that Google handsets collected a notably larger volume of data than Apple. A megabyte of data being sent from Google Pixels, for instance, every 12 hours compared with 52 kilobytes sent from an iPhone. It's a lot, that's a different, very different amount of data. I, you know, this study doesn't say what data was sent back. They say potentially, data potentially sent back the insertion of a SIM, hardware serial number, IMEI, Wi-Fi, MAC address, and phone number, all of which, by the way, is sent back and forth to the network for a variety of reasons. You know, you, your phone has to identify it to the net, itself to the network and so forth. Insertion of a SIM, well, that's an announcement that you're joining a new network, all of that stuff. That's just kind of how it works. I would like to know, and this study, I'm going to throw it out, because I would like to know, well, for instance, what data is being sent back? What's the 52 kilobytes coming from, that's nothing, coming from the iPhone, compared to the megabyte coming from the Google phone? And actually, it could be worse if the iPhone's sending your location, you know, constantly to Apple. That could be worse. But it but you're, I mean, what is the surprise here? You're sharing the phone. If it's on, is constantly connected to the internet, constantly connected to cell towers, constantly sending back to your cell carrier information. It has to. That's how they work. A spokesman for Google points this out. That's how smartphones work. Modern cars regularly send basic data about vehicle components, their safety status, and service schedules to car manufacturers. Mobile phones do the same. Apple has not yet commented. This is one of those, I think, kind of weak sauce stories that you see all the time these days. Big tech is ruining the world. But then when you dig down a little bit, the headline is scary. Smartphones share our data every four and a half minutes. <laughs> but the payoff is not. I wouldn't worry about it. I really wouldn't. A little bit more of a concern for those people, uh, businesses mostly running exchange servers. Microsoft said, oh, whoo. Remember that remember that zero day flaw that let bad guys into your email server? Hey, good news. 92% of vulnerable servers have been patched. Okay, but that means 8% have not. And furthermore, Microsoft says even if you've fixed the problem doesn't mean somebody's not already in there and continues to have access. So, it's kind of Microsoft's putting a bright shiny smile on this dark cloud of doom. Yeah, 92% are fixed, 8% are not. And the rest could already be, could still be compromised. Could still be compromised. Rumors that Microsoft wants to buy Discord. Selling price. Discord, do you know what Discord is? Ask a kid. Ask a gamer. Because they use Discord like crazy to communicate in between gamers during the game. They use Discord for that. They can do voice or text chat. It's actually used for a lot of things. It's a very strong messaging platform. 
Microsoft uh, in the market to buy at $10 billion. Microsoft's CEO, the very smart and talented Satya Nadella, says this next decade, it's all going to be about creation, creation, creation. He said it three times. He said technology has been used for consumption, 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 you know, watching, binging Netflix, that kind of thing. But now we're all creators. That's why Microsoft apparently was trying to buy TikTok. They were also apparently trying to buy Pinterest. They didn't get either of them. Now they're trying to buy Discord. Creators, creators, creators. I would say a new, a different term. Data, data, data. Everybody wants to know more about you. Does that feel good? Everybody's trying to figure out what you want. What, what do you want? <laughs> they're trying to buy up companies. They're sending data back from their smartphones. They're doing everything they can. Third party tracking cookies. They're doing everything they can to figure out what you want. That's, that's pretty flattering, isn't it? Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? You know, this was a bad week for uh, tech news. Only say that because it's April Fool's Day. It was April, you know, it was on Thursday. And oh, I hate April Fool's Day. I really do. You look it over your shoulder all day, aren't you? Were there other April Fool's? I don't know. Because I don't, you know, I'm just trying to avoid the tech news because I don't know what to believe. So, for instance... There was a story which did not make it to mainstream media. And I think it didn't make it to mainstream media because mainstream media was going, is this a joke? It was, you know, I don't even know if I should uh, repeat this. Except that it, it was everywhere. It, well, not in mainstream news. It was like, it was a bunch of university press releases, some tech blogs. I think I'm going to believe it. Massive security breach at U.S. universities. A massive data breach has hit U.S. universities, including, and some of the biggest, best-known institutions in America, Stanford, University of California, University of Miami, University of Colorado Boulder, that's where my son went, Yeshiva University, Syracuse, University of Maryland in Baltimore. Hackers have stolen terabytes of student, prospective student, and prospective student. You don't even have to be a student and employee personal information, including transcripts, financial info, mailing addresses, phone numbers, usernames, passwords, and dum 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 social security numbers. Ooh, ooh. It's part of a larger leak of a piece of software called Excelion FTA. If you even apply to those colleges and sent them personal uh, or financial information, maybe for you know uh, a scholarship. So this is the new style with ransomware. You get in, you put a lot of uh, encrypto bombs all over the place. They don't go off right away. You put them around. Those are the things that will encrypt all the data so that you can ask for Bitcoin. But then you also, before you set those little numbers off, you go around and you collect a lot of data, in this case, terabytes of information. And then you go to the university and you say, okay, you got, <laughs> you're going to either pay us because we've encrypted your data, and if you don't, for every day you don't pay us, we're going to release. They wanted $10 million in Bitcoin from each of the universities. Hello, says the email. Your network has been hacked. A lot of valuable data stolen. We are the CLOP ransomware team. You know, maybe it's a language thing, but that's not a great acronym. C-L-O-P. CLOP. You can Google news and articles about us. We have a website where we publish news and stolen files from companies that refuse to cooperate. We suggest you contact us via chat within 24 hours to discuss the current situation. We don't want to hurt. They're, they're nice hackers, the cloppers. Our goal is money. Okay. Well, they didn't get money. Excelion FTA is a server. It's a vulnerable, apparently, server. And the bad guys took advantage of it to get into a lot of places, including all those universities. But they have started releasing information. Colorado, I don't think this is an April Fool's joke. Colorado University notified if you have to by the way the law now which is thank goodness they passed this law is you cannot hide this you cannot bury it you must announce i think within 72 hours if you have a data breach if you learn of a data breach so colorado university boulder sending out notifications while the full scope has not yet been determined early this is from their breach notification early information from the forensic investigation Confirms the vulnerability was exploited and multiple data types may have been accessed, including CU Boulder and CU Denver. Student personally identifiable information, PII. Prospective student. People applied personally identifiable information. Employee, PII. Limited health and clinical data. Oh, well, that's a relief. 
study and research to everything. The Klopp gang began to post screenshots of the stolen data, including university financial documents, student grades, academic records, enrollment information, biographical information. So I hope if you are a student of one of those universities, if you were a student of one of those universities, if you are applying to those universities, because this is, you know, this is this, this was the season for your high school senior, look for a notice. By the way, Klopp also got to other users of Excellion, including Kroger, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, Singtel, Singapore Telecom, QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute, and the Office of the Washington State Auditor, plus Shell, Shell Oil, any one of those be worth $10 million. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. On March 4th, 1929, Herbert Hoover, the former Secretary of Commerce, who had helped amateur radio during its embryonic years, became President of the United States. Less than eight months later, the nation was thrown into the Great Depression. Stock prices fell 80%, the gross national product fell 50%, and unemployment was at 25%. It did not sound like a good time to waste money on a frivolous hobby such as amateur radio. And yet, the early 1930s was the period of the greatest growth in our history. From 1929 census of 16,829, amateur radio expanded 276% in five years to a total of 46,390 in 1934. What was life like in our hobby of 75 years ago? QST was 25 cents per issue. One of the interesting columns in it was called Calls Heard, which was simply a list of page after page of call signs that were heard by various stations reporting in. Each month, hams would scan the hundreds of calls listed to see if their signals had been noticed. One of the call signs listed was W2XAF, which was not an amateur station, but rather the shortwave relay of WGY Schenectady. In fact, in the 1930s, there were so many broadcast stations with shortwave relays that the call book listed them in addition to amateur call signs. Most of the ads in QST at that time were for components to construct your own station. Tubes, resistors, and condensers, not capacitors, condensers, were displayed in full-page ads. RCA and DeForest were the dominant entities in the tube field. If you needed A, B, and C batteries, the Burgess Battery Company in Madison, Wisconsin would supply them. As the 1930s progressed, more companies appeared with kits or even assembled units. Hammerland, then known as Hammerland Roberts Incorporated, made its debut with the AC Pro, an eight-tube Superhat receiver. National's new receiver was the SW3. Radio Engineering Labs, known as REL of Long Island City, supplied low-cost transmitters and receiver kits. In 1931, one of these kits was at the center of a legal battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. RCA, which held the DeForest patents on the regenerative circuit, sued REL. Edwin Armstrong, who actually invented regeneration but lost a controversial court battle with DeForest, saw this as an opportunity to win back his patent. He purchased 51% of REL stock and proceeded to fight the grand battle once more. Unfortunately, in 1934, the Supreme Court ruled that DeForest, not Armstrong, was the inventor of regeneration. Armstrong could take some small consolation in that another of his inventions was finally put to good use in amateur radio, super regeneration. Invented in the early 1920s, Super Regeneration provides very high sensitivity on AM signals. However, it has almost no selectivity, a very high noise level in the absence of stations, and radiated a broad interfering signal to nearby receivers. 
It was useless on medium wave or short wave, but was perfect for the 5 meter band at 56 megacycles. During the early 1930s, Ross Hull, QST's associate editor, wrote many articles about 5 meters and the surprising propagation there. Many phone stations appeared on the 56 megacycle band and almost all used Super Regeni receivers and some even operated full duplex. If UHF phone doesn't interest you, how about amateur television? In 1931, you ask? Unbelievably, the answer is yes. In 1931, an article appeared in QST describing the spinning disc mechanical television system that had been around since the 1920s. It was clumsy and crude, but it worked. The Jenkins Television Corporation of Passaic, New Jersey, offered a spinning disc kit within QST's pages. Within nine years, however, the mechanical system was rendered obsolete by RCA's all-electronic system. The Madrid Conference was held in 1932. Unlike the 1927 Washington Conference, amateur radio was not in danger and no frequencies were lost. 1932 also saw the expansion of the phone bands, but a special endorsement was needed to operate them. The old man was still around, with his letters in QST about rotten operators, rotten band conditions, rotten stations, etc. In fact, everything that didn't meet the old man's standards was rotten. For the past 15 years he had been writing, no one knew who he was. Finally, when Hiram Percy Maxim died in 1936, the ARRL revealed that Maxim indeed was the old man. By the way, since HP Maxim, W1AW, was still alive in the early 1930s, the ARRL station call was W1MK. Dealers included Uncle Dave Marks, whose first store was located at 115 North Pearl Street in Albany, New York. This address is significant to me because I now work in the building that stands on that site. By 1934, the Federal Radio Commission was superseded by the FCC and a new license structure with Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses was in place. In our next installment, we will take a look at the late 1930s, particularly some events in 1938. I hope you can join me. Pending future FCC action, amateur radio's secondary use of the 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz band segment may continue indefinitely. With more details, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. The FCC is part of a lengthy second report and order for commercial licensing of 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz adopted on March 17th, agreed with ARRL that continued access by amateur radio to 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz should be allowed until consideration of the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz segment in a later proceeding. The FCC action represents a partial and temporary reprieve from the FCC's December 2019 proposal to remove amateur radio from the entire band. And it makes available an additional 50 MHz than last fall's FCC proposal to give hams temporary use of 3.3 to 3.4 GHz. Amateur radio secondary operation in the 3.45 to 3.5 gigahertz band must cease 90 days after public notice that the spectrum auction has closed and licensing has begun. That is expected to happen early in 2022. The FCC advised amateur operators not to expect more than a short period of notice before operations must cease. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The FCC stated that while we adopt our proposal to bifurcate the band, we adjust our proposal and set 3450 megahertz as the frequency at which the band will be split. It agreed with the ARRL's assessment that the guard band is not necessary from a technical standpoint. We also recognize that the nature of amateur equipment realities makes the 50 MHz at 3400 to 3450 MHz particularly valuable to amateur operators because it means existing equipment can continue to operate in the band for the time being. 
This allows amateur operators to continue in the lower portion of the band while the FCC and federal government users continue to analyze whether that spectrum can be reallocated for flexible use, the FCC said. The commission had proposed splitting the band at 3.4 gigahertz, permitting amateur use in 100 megahertz of spectrum, while also providing a buffer to protect flexible use operations at the lower edge of the 3.45 gigahertz band. We therefore allow secondary amateur operations to continue in the 3.4 to 3.45 gigahertz portion of the band, the FCC said. We emphasize, however, that amateur licensees remain secondary users and those that operate on frequencies close to the 3450 megahertz band edge must do so with a particular caution to avoid causing harmful interference to flexible use licenses in the 3.45 gigahertz service which hold primary status. In the light of these considerations, while amateur operations between 3450 MHz and 3500 MHz must cease within 90 days of the public notice announcing the close of the auction for the 3.45 GHz service, as specified in the report and order, amateur operations may continue between 3300 MHz and 3450 MHz while the Commission, the NTIA, and the Department of Defense continue to analyze whether that spectrum can be reallocated for commercial wireless use. There is no expectation that such operations will be accommodated in future planning for commercial wireless operations in this spectrum or that amateur operators will receive more than a short period of notice before their operations must cease, the FCC said. It's time now for this week's propagation forecast. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspots were only visible on four days of the current reporting week, on April 3rd through the 6th, and now on Friday morning still, there are no sunspots. As a result, average daily sunspot numbers declined from 11.9 last week to 6.4 currently. Average daily solar flux also dropped from 77.4 to 73.4, and on Thursday the daily solar flux was 74 just above the average for the previous seven days of 73.4. The sun remains blank. The average daily planetary A index declined from 8.9 to 6.6, .6, and the average mid-latitude A index slipped from 7.7 .7 to 5.6. So, the predicted solar flux for the next few days is 74 on April 9th to the 15th, 72 on April 16th to the 20th, 74 on April 21st to the 26th, 73 on April 27th to May 1st, and 72 on May 2nd to the 5th. The predicted planetary A index is projected to be 5, 10, and 8 on April 9th through the 11th, 5 on April 12th and 13th, 8 on April 14th and 15th, 15 and 18 on April 16th and 17th, 8 on April 18th and 19th, 5 on April 20th and 21st, 8 on April 22nd and 24th, 8 on April 22nd to the 24th, 5 on April 25th to May 1st, and 8 on May 2nd to the 4th. Time now for the AMSAT report. Field day is right around the corner. Brush up on the ARRL rules. If you plan to operate on satellite for more than just your club's bonus points, you're in luck. AMSAT holds satellite field day at the same time, but with a few differences. AMSAT allows all of the satellite contacts you want on linear satellites with as many different stations as you can hit. In fact, you can work the same station on every linear satellite, both CW and phone. AMSAT allows only one contact period on any FM satellite, so more ARRL field day participants can get their bonus contacts. If you want more information, browse AMSAT.org and click on Events and AMSAT field day on satellites. The one true rule for field day, whether ARRL or AMSAT, Murphy will visit and you want to be prepared. Check everything before field day, have spares, have extra coax, have extra mics, and the list goes on and on. Most of all, enjoy yourself. This year, AMSAT has made concessions for Class D at-home stations. The weekly AMSAT report comes to us courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. On April the 4th, AMSAT DL opens the Q0100 narrowband satellite transponder to general contest operation in the upper mixed mode range. This coming weekend, April the 10th and 11th, we'll see the Yuri Gagarin contest working via the satellite.
The contest area on the QO100 geostationary satellite for both CW and single sideband operation is uplink area 2400.370 MHz to 2400.490 MHz and the downlink area is 10489.870 MHz to 10489.990 MHz. Of course, the usual QO100 narrowband transponder guidelines also apply here. Therefore, the bandwidth should still be limited to 2.7 kHz and the transmitting power should be reduced so that only as much power as necessary should be used. You can read the AMSAT DL announcement and see the band plan at amsat-dl.org forward slash en. The Yuri Gagarin International DX Contest 2021 is dedicated to the memory of Yuri Gagarin, who made the first human flight through space on April 12, 1961. The contest runs from 21 hours UTC on April the 10th until 21 hours UTC on April the 11th, and the contest rules can be seen at golfcharlie.qst.ru forward slash en. The majority of the FCC's revised Part 97 rules adopted in December 2020, establishing new application fees, become effective on April 19th but the new amateur radio application fees will not become effective on April 19th. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more. The FCC announced on March 19th that the new fees would not become effective until Congress has been notified, the FCC's information technology systems and internal procedures have been updated, and the FCC publishes the notices in the Federal Register announcing the effective date, which is expected to be by this summer. The $35 fee would apply to new modification, as were upgrade and sequential call sign changes, renewal and vanity call sign applications, as well as applications for a special temporary authority or a rule waiver. All fees would be per application. Administrative updates, such as a change of mailing address, emailing address, or name, are exempt. Once the FCC application fee takes effect, new and upgrade applicants will pay the $15 exam session fee to the VE team, as usual, and pay the $35 application fee directly to the FCC. ARRL will post specifics on our website when the time comes. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. It is expected that such fees will not become effective before summer 2021. The FCC has stated that amateurs will have advance warning of the actual effective date because it will publish such date in the Federal Register. ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, said VECs and volunteer examiner teams will not have to collect the $35 fee at exam sessions. Soma said this information was provided in a VE newsletter distributed this past week. Further news and instructions will follow when we have them, she said. The FCC exempted the fee applications for administrative updates, such as a change of mailing or email address. The FCC proposed a schedule of application and other fees for all services last year. Over in Ireland, the Southeastern Amateur Radio Group, Echo India 2 Whiskey Romeo Charlie, will be active using the call sign Echo India 2 India Mike Delta on Saturday, April the 24th, as an official Marconi station for the International Marconi Day 2021. The station will be active solely from Tremor, County Waterford. Tramor has a direct connection with Marconi as he often stayed there with his aunt, a Mrs. Cookman, who resided at The Cove, Tramor. Due to the current travel situation, the organisers, the Cornish Radio Amateur Club, have allowed the EI2WRC members to run the special call from their own homes. A special QSL card will be made available once printed. More details will be made known in the coming weeks. Keep an eye on the EI2 IMD QRZ page. And for more information on International Marconi Day on April the 24th, go to www.golfxray4charlieromeocharlie.com.
The only other Aero station currently listed on the International Marconi Day site is Echo India Zero Mike Alpha Romeo from the Martello Tower at Houth in Dublin. Kevin O'Dell, N0 IRW, Oklahoma's long serving section manager, serving two terms from 2010 to 2014, and again serving since 2016, has decided to step down effective April 9th, 2021. Although he is stepping down as Oklahoma section manager, Odell will continue to serve Amateur Radio and ARRL as a member of ARRL's Public Relations Committee. Prior to becoming section manager, Odell served as both a public information officer and as the public information coordinator for the Oklahoma section for many years. Mark P. Klein, N5HZR, a resident of Norman, Oklahoma, has been appointed to replace Odell as Oklahoma section manager effective April 9th and will serve out the balance of Odell's term which extends to September 30th, 2022. Klein has been a very active member of the Oklahoma amateur radio community for many years, currently serving as an Oklahoma assistant section manager, a leader of the South Canadian Amateur Radio Society, and as president of the Central Oklahoma Radio Amateurs, a group of nine amateur radio clubs that host the Oklahoma City Hamfest Ham Holiday. An ARRL life member, Klein is also an amateur radio licensed class instructor and volunteer examiner for three different volunteer examiner coordinators. ARRL Radio Sport and Field Services Manager Bart Jenke, W9JJ, made the appointment based on the recommendations of ARRL West Gulf Division Director John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, Odell, N0IRW, West Gulf Vice Director Lee Cooper, W5LHC, and leaders of the Oklahoma section. Foundations of Amateur Radio a little while ago, I was gifted a new radio, well, new to me, a Kenwood TS480 Hotel X-Ray. It's an all-mode HF transceiver with 6 meters, does 200 watts, but you know me, I'm into QRP, low power, so I first had to figure out how to dial the transmitter down to 5 watts, and that was after figuring out how to feed the dual power supplies from one source, and have the fuses work as expected. When I received the radio, I took stock of all the bits that it was packed with, all complete, all the accessories, even the user manual was laminated. The previous owner, Walter, Victor Kilo 6, Bravo Charlie Papa, now Silent Key, whom I never met, was an amateur after my own heart. I've talked about how he meticulously documented his alterations to a power supply, for example. Previously, I've taken this radio on holidays to operate portable in field day. The experience was underwhelming, in that I didn't hear anyone and nobody responded to my CQ calls. At the time I put it down to a poor antenna and unfamiliarity with the radio, despite reading the manual, well, at least scanning it. Today I finally set some time aside to do some more testing. I decided that the first step would be to actually set it up in my shack, next to my trusty Yaesu FT-857D, and see how it performs in comparison. So, I plugged everything in, found a coax switch so I could switch the antenna between the two radios, and learned that the audio connector that I've been using for digital modes on the Yaesu is actually compatible with the Kenwood. Now I need to make another adapter for this radio, but in the meantime I can move the audio plug between radios when I swap. In doing this I learned a few things. One is that there's plenty of scope for things to break. For example, I was reaching over the desk to plug a connector into the coax switch when I leaned on the keyboard and touched the spacebar. This caused the radio that I was working on to start its tuning cycle without an antenna connected. Fortunately, I was using 5 watts and I caught it within seconds, so no white smoke this time around. It does remind me to turn off the radio when fiddling with connectors though. I am embarrassed to report that I thought I'd learned that lesson already. Nothing like a refresher course in transmitter safety, and dumb things not to do in the shack. Then there was the thing about using remote control. In my naivety, I thought that the connector that the Yeso uses for computer control is also used on the Kenwood. Turns out that it isn't. Fortunately, I read the manual before plugging that in. The Yesu has a specific digital mode with individual gain and filter characteristics, which seem to be completely lacking on the Kenwood. I'm still attempting to learn the differences in receive performance between the two. 
I started this process by running WSJTX and listening to Whisper, or Weak Signal Propagation Reports, and testing how both radios decode things. I cannot yet do this side by side, but for now, I can swap and see signals coming in on either radio. This is not the first time I've put a different radio on my desk to see how it works, and it's not going to be the last time. What I'm looking to achieve is to swap over from the Yaesu to the Kenwood in my shack, so I can put the Yaesu back in the car and have a mobile shack operating again, because I have to admit, I do miss that. What kinds of testing regimes do you have when you're trying out a new radio? I'd love to hear your thoughts. My email address, as always, is cq at vk6flab.com. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. John Desmond, Echo India 7 Golf Lima, writes in his blog about the Victor Oscar 1 Foxtrot Mike monitoring station in St. John's, Newfoundland, that will soon be listening for transatlantic FT8 signals in the 2 meter band. The receiver will be using SDR console version 3 and WSJTX. It will report to the PSK Reporter website using the callsign Victor Oscar 1 Foxtrot November. The station will be located in St. John's, Newfoundland, and will use two stacked 5-element 144 MHz LFAQ quad-style Yagis from Innov antennas. The antennas will be pointing at Western Europe, and the receiver will be listening on 144.174 MHz, which is the FT8 frequency. In his blog, John asks, is transatlantic on 144 MHz possible? Well, the distance across the North Atlantic between Newfoundland and Ireland is just over 3,000 kilometres. This is well beyond the normal 2,300 kilometres or so range for normal sporadic E or meteor scatter. And it seems unlikely that this distance would be spanned by a single marine tropo duct going all the way across. But it's not impossible. The North Atlantic is not noted for its fine calm weather, and there is always some low pressure system somewhere in there stirring things up. The station is expected to start monitoring 144.174 MHz from the end of May. And you can catch up with it all on John's blog at ei7golflima.blogspot.com. Radio amateurs are invited to take part in the Mars exercise now underway this weekend in support of the U.S. Department of Defense. The five USB channelized 60 meter frequencies are available for interoperability communication between services. By convention, Channel 1 is designated the calling channel. This convention is established to train the amateur radio community to reach out on Channel 1 in times of national emergency for information from the federal government. The amateur radio community utilizes 60 meters on a secondary basis with federal agencies. This and similar 60-meter interoperability exercises are conducted during the first full week of each month. Air Force Mars has Sunday 0501 UTC through Wednesday 1701 UTC. Army Mars picks up on Wednesday 1701 UTC through Saturday 0501 UTC. There is no service crossover. The operating convention for Mars 60 meter interface with the amateur community designates Channel 1 as primary. For the purpose of this exercise, Air Force Mars phone operations will originate on Channel 1, digital and CW operations on Channel 2. If congestion occurs, either mode may direct their traffic to Channels 3 through 5. The only authorized digital modes are CW, M110A, Olivia, MT63, MFSK16, FT8, and RTTY. M110A will likely have little or no use in this exercise. Aris USA, a Maryland nonprofit corporation, has earned recognition from the U.S. Internal Revenue Service as a Section 501c3 charitable, scientific, and educational organization. Aris USA is the U.S. segment of the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station International Working Group. With this IRS determination, donations to Aris USA 
become tax deductible in the U.S. retroactive to May 21, 2020. This status allows the organization to solicit donations and grants. Aris USA says it will continue to promote student involvement with the astronauts on the International Space Station via amateur radio. Working with educational organizations, ARIS provides opportunities to inspire, engage, and educate our next generation of space explorers through STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math activities and content. The educational scope and reach of what ARIS accomplishes has grown significantly since our beginnings in 1996, said ARIS USA Executive Director Frank Bauer. We are actively working to extend student reach even further. This through the pursuit of potential student opportunities on human spaceflight missions beyond low Earth orbit is part of our amateur radio exploration program. The first AREX destination, the Moon. ARIS USA continues to collaborate with ARIS International and U.S. sponsors, partners, and interest groups. ARIS's sponsors are NASA Space Communication and Navigation and the ISS National Lab. Donations to ARIS USA are tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. Frank Howell, K4MH, followed up his two-part National Contest Journal series, The Demographics of Contesting, with a post to his Social Circuits blog called Lemmings Over a Demographic Cliff? Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, had a chance to talk to Howell and files this special report from League Headquarters. Howell points to data showing that radio contesters are older than the average ARRL member. He reports that leisure pursuits are highest during youth and young adulthood, but dramatically taper off between 25 and 34 until age 55 and older. Howell argues that the formats of major radio contests may serve the leisure interests of established contesters, those on the far end of the demographic spectrum, but may not offer the best experience for contesting newcomers. How many big guns are 25 years old? Not that many for my county. So those highly invested in the status quo really won't be around to experience this diminishing number of participants but they now have the political clout to direct strategic actions. So what I'm calling for is simply a consideration of how contesting is organized and is it really stacked for those who have time to do the BIC activity of butt in chair for long-term contesting. We don't think millennials really like that kind of activity. So are we willing to change contesting rules and the character of contesting so that it fits those born after the baby boom? That's the big question. Howell argues that demography does not have to be destiny. It does require taking the blinders off tradition and evaluating it for what it is today and what it means for the future, he says. His original articles appeared in the July, August, and September, October 2020 issues of the journal. Howell points to data showing that radio contesters are older than the average ARRL member. Taking into account information from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics on Leisure Time Use, Howell opines that this should be expected. This hollowing out of leisure and sport time is a predictable outcome of competing and more important activities. According to Howell, the main competitor to radio amateurs engaging in on-the-air or workshop activities is television now more broadly referred to as screen time. A Brookings institution on the topic using the 2005 to 2015 time use survey documents how free time became screen time. Around 2007, screen time, not just television, surpassed other active leisure activities in the average time spent category. By 2015, the gap favoring screen time was more than one hour, reflecting on average of some 11 hours per week of activity. Howell argues that formats of major radio contests may serve the leisure interests of established contesters. 
those on the far end of the demographic spectrum, but may not offer the best experience for contesting newcomers. The ability for single operators to compete at a high level in a major contest requires time, equipment, and skill that are probably beyond many in the Caterpillar stage, ARRL Contest Update Editor Brian Moran, N9ADG, recently observed. He suggests that most school-aged operators don't have the time to stay in the chair all weekend. Those fortunate to be able to join seasoned teams of multi-operators at well-equipped stations have a different contesting experience than those plugging away solo, Moran said. With the opportunity for mentorship, camaraderie of a group effort, and a chance to be a part of something bigger, they'll be more likely to emerge from their expected dormancy period as a contest butterfly. Since zooming to prominence after its debut in mid-2017, the popular FT8 digital protocol has become the mode of choice for some 60% of HF operators. According to Clublog's latest activity report compiled by Michael Wells, G7VJR. FT8 is one of the protocols in the WSJTX suite of free programs. Wells says FT8 activity level sits at nearly 85% on 6 meters. The dramatic FT8 upswing has come at the expense of phone, CW, RTTY, PSK, and other modes. Over the same period, the number of FT8 contacts logged each year per active call sign has continued to climb to about 60% between 2015 and 2021, with the most dramatic increase being nearly 29% in the past year. The use of all other modes has continued to flutter downward since the advent of FT8, which occupies vastly less spectrum than more traditional ham radio operating modes. Between 2015 and 2020, the number of contacts logged per day by club log users has trended steadily upwards regardless of the mode. The report draws on data of more than 84,000 logs uploaded to the club log site, some 730 million contacts in all. Wells reported that in 2025, the typical call sign logged 620 CW contacts, 558 SSB contacts, and 372 digital contacts. Five years later, the statistics were 500, 300, and 1700, respectively. ARL's Logbook of the World does not typically report this level of detail as far as mode usage is concerned, but the statistics available certainly confirm FT8's increasing popularity. The rocketing usage of FT8 over the past few years may be demonstrated most dramatically by a comparison in contacts by mode statistics between March of 2017 and March of 2018, when the FT8 contact numbers in the hundreds shot to some 2.6 million contacts by the following year, an increase of nearly 1 million percent. From mid-2019 to mid-2020, FT8 usage appears to have slumped slightly to 50 percent before climbing back to 60 percent. FT8 usage peaked at just 65% in late 2020 and has held steady at 60 to 65% since. The same period saw SSB usage slip by 15%, CW activity by 10%, and RTTY by 29%. Introduced later, FT4, the contest mode of FT8, showed an initial fast upward trajectory before steadying at 5 to 8%. Named after its developers, Stan Frank, K9AN, and Joe Taylor, K1JT, FT8 indicates the mode's 8-frequency shift keying format. Tones are spaced at 6.25 Hz, and an FT8 signal occupies just 50 Hz. The Radio Society of Great Britain is delighted to launch a new award that's designed to celebrate the friendship of amateur radio over the airwaves. Radio amateurs are encouraged to exchange the four-letter identifier of their club and accumulate points for each qualifying QSO. Through this, you can gain the award. However, the main purpose of the award is to contact other people in a friendly and non-competitive way, connecting with them rather than simply making a quick QSO and moving on. If you're not a club member, but you are a member of the RSGB, you can use the RSGB identifier Romeo Sierra Golf Bravo. There will be monthly and annual awards for individuals, clubs and the highest scoring club in each region. The point system is simply an encouragement to get on the air, represent your club and have a chat with radio amateurs across the airwaves. The award is part of the RSGB and NHS Get on the Air to Care campaign, which was created at the start of the pandemic. 
Its aim has been to support radio amateurs living in social isolation, promote mental well-being, and to raise the profile of amateur radio in the mainstream media to help people looking for something to do during lockdown. The Society hopes that the Friendship on the Air Award will continue to support the radio amateur community as restrictions lift over the coming months. The award also links in with the chosen theme of Home But Never Alone for World Amateur Radio Day on Sunday the 18th of April 2021. To find out how to take part in the Friendship on the Air Award, visit the RSGB website www.rsgb.org forward slash friendship hyphen award. Take a highly directional microphone array and processor, a team of drones and a wild landscape with the potential for the danger of getting lost, and you have a promising search and rescue communications tool. At least that's what executives at Dotterill, a company in Auckland, New Zealand, are hoping. Outfitting drones with this kind of audio payload is providing two-way radio capability that can conduct search and rescue over large areas by hearing people's cries for help. This adds one more tool to the versatile toolbox of public safety operations, which already contains the ability to use thermal imaging, cell phone signals, and visual imagery. According to an article in Drone Life, this radio installation will permit two-way communications with people on the ground calling for aid and who can provide details of their injuries. Sean Edlin, the company's CEO, said in a press release that the microphones are able to receive highly directional audio on the ground as the signal remains uncompromised by drone propeller noise and other sounds. Brady McCarthy, Auckland search and rescue leader, said audio will provide an extra capability for the team's operations going forward. The International Amateur Radio Union continued preparing for World Radio Communication Conference 2023 by attending the second meeting of the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administrations Conference Preparatory Group Project Team A on March 23rd to the 25th. IARU Region 1 Spectrum Affairs Chair Barry Lewis, G4SJH, said that Project Team A develops the CEPT WRC briefs for several WRC scientific and regulatory agenda items of particular interest to the amateur community. Specific attention is being paid to WRC 23 Agenda Items 1.12, 1.14, and 9.1a. IARU put forward its agreed preliminary positions for these agenda items at the meeting. Lewis said IARU's overall objective is to safeguard the allocations to the amateur and amateur satellite services in co-located and adjacent frequency bands within the scope of each agenda item. The CEPT briefs include a special section in which the views of all recognized international and regional organizations can be placed, and IARU's views are now in this section of the draft briefs for each of these agenda items. Agenda Item 1.12, Earth Exploration Satellite Service for Spaceborne Radar Sounders within the range of frequencies around 45 megahertz. IARU's position is to ensure that adjacent band 50 megahertz amateur services are protected. CEPT has not voiced a position yet. Agenda Item 1.14, Possible new primary frequency allocations to Earth Exploration Satellite Service in the frequency range 231.5 to 252 GHz. IARU's position is no change to the 248 to 250 GHz primary allocations and to the 241 to 248 GHz secondary allocations. CEPT supports the Earth Exploration Satellite Service proposal. Agenda Item 9.1a, Radio Service Designations for Space Weather Sensors. IARU's position is to avoid additional constraints on amateur services. CEPT's position is not yet defined. The IARU Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee continues to be active in Project Team A and in all CEPT project teams dealing with WRC-23 preparations. CEPT Conference Preparatory Group Project Team A will also consider agenda item proposals to be put forward at WRC 27. CPG Project Team A meeting documents are available on the CEPT website. 
Visit the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 webpage for more information on WRC 23 preparations. The 10th anniversary of Maritime Radio Day will take place from 1200 UTC on April 14th to 2200 UTC on April 15th. The annual event commemorates nearly 90 years of wireless service for seafarers. Radio amateurs and shortwave listeners are welcome and should register in advance. Stations such as coastal radio stations and ships may participate only if operated by former commercial or Navy operators or by radio technicians who worked on the installation and or maintenance of naval equipment. Former Merchant Marine radio operators or former ship's electronic technicians are encouraged to participate. All traffic must occur around the following international naval frequencies on the amateur radio bands. 1.824 kHz, 3.520, 7.020, 10.118 kHz, 14.052, 21.052, and 28.052 kHz. The primary working frequency is 14.052 kHz. There is no power limit. Operators should submit an email or letter detailing station's work to Ralph Marshner, DL9CM, Narcissweg, 10 53359 Rhinebeck, Germany. In other news, the Online Com Academy 2021 is set for April 10th and 11th. The 2021 Com Academy is two days of training, talks, and information on emergency communications and amateur radio. This year's theme is Disasters Here, There, and Everywhere. Are we ready? Registration is free and required to gain access to the complete schedule and academy materials. The Academy is entirely virtual this year and hosted online. Headquartered in Seattle, Washington, Com Academy is attended and supported by organizations including the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, the Auxiliary Communications Service, EOC Support Teams, the Civil Air Patrol, Coast Guard Auxiliary, REACT, and CERT, among others. All interested in emergency and amateur radio communications are welcome to network and share experiences. The event focuses on education for communications leaders, volunteers, and professionals. The Creative Week Signal Digital Communication Conversational Application, known as JSA Call, is this year's recipient of the Amateur Radio Software Award. The award, founded by Klaus AE0S, is an international honor recognizing the spirit of innovation given freely to the amateur radio community. Congratulations to Jordan Scherer, KN4CRD of Atlanta, Georgia, who created the application as an extension of the FT8 protocol. According to the awards website, the application was five years in the works and has added new vitality to digital communications, most particularly among members of the ARIES. It is available to users as a free download. On its qrz.com page, Jordan describes the application as a derivative of KSJTX that focuses on long-term keyboard-to-keyboard style communications, similar to what you see in FL Digi or FSQ. Jordan will receive his award certificate and a grant of $300. Here's a listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Remember that the ARRL Learning Network is a members-only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinars webpage. Finding and Fixing RFI, hosted by Paul Cianciello, W1VLF, will be held on Tuesday, April 20th, 2021, at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Radio Frequency Interference, or RFI, has been a problem for ham radio operators and shortwave listeners since the radio hobby began. Noise has gotten worse over the last 20 years or so with the advent of widespread solar power, LED lighting, grow lights, and the vast array of digital devices. Learn all about finding and fixing RFI in today's world. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, is scheduled for Thursday, May 6th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, or 1930 UTC an educational seminar to help both new and experienced HF operators who find themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, discuss the various noise sources, and talk about how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. Visit the W1AW Antenna Farm, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q. 
This webinar has a date that is to be determined as we go to air. During this upcoming webinar, you will experience a bird's eye view and description of the antennas used by W1AW for the station's scheduled transmissions and visiting operator activity. All the antennas used at W1AW are single band Yagi's. Viewers will also see the 5 GHz sector antennas that are part of the W1AW's Arden system. All of these Learning Network presentations are sponsored by ICOM. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Remember that the ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change and you should visit the ARRL website for the latest schedule. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with, on towers, on the roof, or on the ground. Waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, four ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, this stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces. But again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about five minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. Problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat, and more. It tends to start to unwrap over time, crack, or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available, so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency, and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. 
I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. A new club to cater for the needs of shortwave listeners and aspiring radio amateurs was launched during the week in the Republic of Ireland. The club is called the National Shortwave Listeners Club and is currently running the Harek online class that commenced on Tuesday last March the 30th. And this class runs for eight weeks on Tuesdays and Thursdays. There's been another massive demand for the classes and 65 prospective radio amateurs are attending the class on the Zoom platform. Revision nights continue weekly on Wednesdays for the two classes that recently finished their courses and will run until they can sit an examination that will hopefully be held soon, depending on progress made in controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. The new Shortwave Listener Club will meet on Sunday nights at 8pm on the Zoom platform and will provide a forum where newcomers and others can meet and improve on their experiences in our wonderful hobby. The club is affiliated to the Irish Radio Transmitters Society. Inquiries about the club, for the time being, can be directed to herricktraining at gmail.com. The date is set, December 15th of this year, for Rebel DX Group to depart Cape Town, South Africa for Bouvet Island and the 3Y0I activation. The team said it is ready as ever following cancellation of the 2019 D-Expedition when they were within sight of the remote island and turned back during a cyclone for safety reasons. The team of eight, led by Polish de-expeditioner Dom, 3Z9DX, expect to be on Bouvet for as many as 30 days and will operate eight stations on 160 through 6 meters using CW, single sideband, FT4, FT8, RIDI, and operations through the Qatar Oscar 100 satellite. The team has continued to appeal for donations to meet its remaining need for $32,000. Meanwhile, the Intrepid DX group has announced that they will be activating the island as well using the call sign 3Y0J. Their 20-day stay on the island is set for January 2023. The team's immediate goal is to continue fundraising to meet their budget of $764,000 before their planned trip aboard the MV Braveheart. The Rebel DX group, in response to the other team's announcement, said in a press release, We would like to wish the recently announced Bouvet D Expedition, all the best successful activity in 2023. There's enough space for even three more activities from 3Y0 land. We know how much detail planning goes into a project like this and cross fingers for them. One of the UK's oldest hospital radio stations marked its 70th birthday with a special day of programs on Friday the 9th of April. Radio Clatterbridge began broadcasting in 1951 when members of Port Sunlight Boys Club hit upon the idea of taking a record player onto the wards to play music to entertain patients. Initially, it had a mixed reception. Those closest to the speaker complained it was too loud, while those at the far end of the ward couldn't hear any music at all. But the hospital authorities were convinced that the idea had merit and agreed to fund a studio and a transmission system connected to each bed. Then, in 1955, a service was launched for Cleaver Hospital in Hessel, which was connected via a telephone landline. The station famously recorded the first radio interview with the Beatles in 1962 at Hume Hall in Port Sunlight. Founder member Monty Lister, who sadly passed away in 2019, also recorded conversations with chart stars including Sir Cliff Richard, Bill Haley and Gracie Fields, as well as one of the last interviews with Eddie Cochran before his untimely death in a plane crash. Extracts from some of the interviews will be broadcast as part of the birthday celebrations, along with other archive audio and the most popular requests from the last seven decades, which ranges from ABBA, Queen and Status Quo, through to Michael Bublé, Tina Turner and Robbie Williams. Today, Radio Clatterbridge is run by a group of around 25 volunteers, with some members having clocked up almost half a century of service. Hundreds of requests are played every year from a fully computerised studio, with patients and staff at the heart of the output. 
The chair of Radio Clatterbridge, Steve Evans, said that, despite the passage of time, the station's prime aim of providing music therapy for patients remains the same. He said, we know from the feedback we get from listeners that there's still a place in 2021 for a hyper-local radio service providing requests, relevant information and entertainment. Radio Clatterbridge moved to its current studio complex in 2001 and became a round-the-clock service in 2003, and it broadcasts on 1386 kilohertz AM as well. A streaming service was launched in 2017, allowing listeners to tune in on mobile devices and online at radioclatterbridge.co.uk. You can read more about this at radiotoday.co.uk. The Youth on the Air programme, better known as Yota, is proud to announce a new Yota-themed contest. It's open to all radio amateurs and Yota stations are worth more points. The first session in 2021 will be held on Saturday, May the 22nd from 08 to 1959 UTC. And the second round is on the 7th of July and the final round is in late December. You can get full details at ham-yota.com forward slash contest. And there's a great video to watch all about the contest. Go to this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website, www.southgatearc.org, and you can click to view it directly. And for aspiring new radio hams, you may like to know that the next free Amateur Radio Foundation online training course run by volunteers from Essex Ham starts on April the 18th, and you should register now. The RSGB's introduction of online exams that can be taken at home has led to a surge in demand for free online amateur radio training courses, such as that run by Essex Ham. You can find out more about online training and register to join a course at www.essexham.co.uk forward slash train. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on-air and podcast, Please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, in a time when multi-channel digital TV is the norm, it's a surprise to find that a few low-power analog stations are still clinging on in some American cities. There are sometimes fill-in stations for weak signal areas or more usually the so-called Franken FM stations who transmit static images or digital patterns and derive income from their sound channel lying at the bottom end of the FM band to form unintended radio stations. Their days are numbered though because the FCC is requiring that they be turned off by July 13th. There's a way forward for the broadcasters to upgrade to low power digital but as you might expect, they're more interested in retaining the Franken FM frequency from which they derive income. The industry is represented by the LPTV Coalition, who have requested permission to retain their FM frequency alongside their digital service. This has faced stiff opposition from other broadcasters, who see the very existence of the Franken FM stations as a flagrant flouting of the rules that shouldn't be rewarded. The FCC has yet to make a ruling, so there remains a slim chance that they may win a reprieve. 
The sad tale of the few lingering analog TV stations in the USA is a last flickering ember of a once huge industry that has been eclipsed without anyone but a few vintage technology geeks noticing. Such has been the success of digital broadcasting. But analog TV is a fascinating and surprisingly intricate system whose passing, however faint, is worth marking. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in